Welcome to Advancing Diversity and Inclusion Across Financial Services, presented by the FDIC and the National Bankers Association. My name is Nikita Pearson, Deputy to the FDIC Chairman for External Affairs and Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. When we last checked, over 2,500 were registered to attend today's session. I want to personally thank you for taking time to join us for this important discussion. This is a subject that is near and dear to our hearts at the FDIC because we know that true equity and inclusion cannot be achieved until every American has access to the full benefits of the banking system. That is why Madam Chairman Yelena McWilliams challenged us to be broad and bold in our approach to advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility within our workforce and the banking industry. And she promised to stand behind her commitment to this work until her chairmanship ends. The fact that we're here today discussing this important topic two weeks before her chairmanship ends is a testament to her commitment to financial inclusion. I'm not saying that she did this alone. She did not. She even acknowledged that she couldn't do it alone in her opening remarks to the FDIC's DEI strategic plan. She said that it would take all hands on deck. And she led the way by engaging our entire workforce and strengthening our relationships with groups like the National Bakers Association to identify real solutions to long-standing challenges. Today, you will hear about those initiatives. I encourage you to take what you learned today, build on it, seek out next steps, and be relentless in your pursuit of a more diverse and equitable financial industry. Remember that intensity makes for a good story, but consistency makes for progress. Let's make this a movement and not just a moment. We'll start the program with opening remarks by Robert James II. Now, Robert has this impressive bio that I could read to you, but it really wouldn't do him justice. I first came to know of Robert when I was a new bank examiner speaking to his father, Robert James Sr., president of Carver State Bank. When he wasn't serving his community, Mr. James was speaking about his son and how he would do great things in the banking industry. And he's done just that. It is my pleasure to introduce Robert James II, Chairman of the National Bankers Association. Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Chairman McWilliams, Director Pearson, Ms. Elam, FDIC staff, and members of our virtual audience, good morning. My name is Robert James II, and I'm privileged to represent Carver State Bank of Savannah, Georgia, in service as chairman of the National Bankers Association. Both Carver and the NBA were founded in 1927 and are celebrating our 95th anniversaries this year. As one of the nation's 19 remaining black controlled banks, Carver has proudly embraced our mission to provide the building blocks to financial freedom. The NBA has distinguished itself with a legacy for providing the voice for America's minority banks, representing black, Asian, Hispanic, and Native American minority depository institutions in our shared goal to eliminate the racial wealth gap in America. Before I begin, I cannot help but reflect that the last time I was in this building, it was at a 2013 interagency MDI conference under the leadership of Bob Mooney, the FDIC's former director for minority and community development banking. Shortly after his retirement from FDIC a few years ago, Bob passed away unexpectedly, but not before the NBA gave him our Lifetime Achievement Award for his unwavering commitment to our banks and the communities we serve. I know that Bob would be very proud to see us here today having this important discussion. And I wanna dedicate my remarks to his memory. 
Thank you, Chairman McWilliams, for inviting us today and for providing this incredible platform to discuss the importance of advancing diversity and inclusion in the financial services sector. Our topic today is timely because we have a deep and widening racial wealth gap in America, and closing that gap would lift our entire economy. Earlier this week, our nation celebrated the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In his final speech in Memphis, he called for economic advancement and connected the dots between basic civil rights, voting rights, and economic participation as being key to enjoying full citizenship in America. Unfortunately, our racial wealth gap has gotten worse since Dr. King was assassinated. According to the Federal Reserve and other economists, in 1968, the median black household had a net worth of about 9.7% of that of the median white household. By 2016, we had lost ground with the median black household worth only about 8.7% as much as the median white household. Closing this gap would be good for everyone. A 2020 report commissioned by Citicorp indicated that if we close the racial wealth gap today, we could add $5 trillion to the U.S. gross domestic product, which would mean more home ownership, more jobs, better health outcomes, and a more resilient country. We all have roles to play in this effort, whether we are MDIs, large banks, community banks, legislators, or regulators. MDIs have historically played a role in making sure minority communities have access to mainstream banking services and credit, and our banks have a crucial role to play in the future. Our banks provide basic banking services to communities that are likely to be unbanked or underbanked, but our impact is limited due to our small size, both in total assets and in number of institutions. Racial minorities, especially Black and Hispanic, are more likely to be unbanked or underbanked, according to the Federal Reserve's report on the economic being of U.S. households in 2020. MDIs can be a solution to this problem if our banks can access more capital to scale up. Several studies have shown that minorities, especially black and brown Americans, are more likely to have bank accounts and access to fair and reasonably priced mortgages and small business loans if there's an MDI in their neighborhood. It's important to note that an average of 70% of minorities do not have a bank branch in their neighborhood. At the same time, MDI branches are in census tracts with 77% minority populations. Properly scaled, MDI banks are best positioned to provide access to capital for minority communities. Unfortunately, MDI's small size, especially among African-American MDIs, has not allowed them to respond as quickly or the or with as much scale as the current economic situation in LMI communities demands. MDIs make up only 3% of all American banks, and Black-owned MDIs only 0.4%. When looking at total bank ass assets, the disparity is even more stark. In the second quarter of 2021, Black banks held about $6 billion in total assets, compared to over $22 trillion in total assets in the U.S. banking system as a whole. Put another way, Black-owned banks only control 27 thousandths of 1% of the total bank assets in the United States. Given the important role these institutions play in the communities they serve, we need to do more to preserve and promote them. Our obligation in this regard is not just morally justified, but required by federal statute. Passed into law in 1989, Section 308 of the Financial Institutions Reform Recovery and Enforcement Act, or FIREA, requires the FDIC and other regulators to preserve and promote MDIs in a variety of ways, including preserving the number of MDIs and assisting them with technical assistance. This statutory obligation should be a part of our overall mission to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. The FDIC and other supervisory agencies have unfortunately failed to preserve and promote MDIs. The overall number of MDIs has declined by 33% since 2008, and among Black-owned MDIs, the problem is even more pronounced. Black-owned banks have suffered from many of the same conditions and social and structural lack of access to capital as the Black community as a whole. Of the 4,377 total insured commercial banks in the U.S., only 144 are MDIs, and only 19 of those are controlled by Black people. Prior to the Great Recession in 2008-2009, there were 41 Black-owned commercial banks in the United States, a loss of more than 50%. Like most community banks, 
MDIs make loans secured by real estate. The legacy of redlining and associated chronic undervaluing of real estate in black communities have created lower asset values for minority banks collateral, which led to massive write downs in their assets. Tier one capital or the equity invested in a bank is the most critical component to the resilience of any bank and it is what allows banks to grow and scale. MDIs, particularly African American MDIs, have historically lacked access to capital markets that would allow them to scale. Without sufficient tier one capital, not only are banks limited in the amount of deposits they can take in, but they are also hampered in their ability to weather loan losses. Without access to capital markets or large pools of high net worth individuals, many black MDIs were forced to exhaust their capital reserves, failing as a result. So what does all of this have to do with diversity and inclusion? Ultimately, the value proposition of making an organization more diverse and inclusive is to bring a variety of perspectives to decision making. When we make sure that qualified people with a variety of lived experiences are in positions of power, we can reach better conclusions to vexing problems. Now, Chairman McWilliams is not necessarily the most likely person to take up the mantle for MDIs. She's a committed conservative appointed by a president who was not exactly a renowned advocate for racial justice, but that's only part of her story. She's also an immigrant who came to this country at a young age in search of a better life. She knows what it's like to be unbanked in America and to work minimum wage jobs. Maybe when she was growing up, she saw circumstances where one group of people mistreated another group of people. Whatever it is, some combination of factors in her lived experience allows her to have empathy for others. And she's applied that empathy to what can otherwise be a very cold regulatory process. Since the passage of FIREA in 1989, Chairman McWilliams has gone further than any other federal regulator in using her position to put a mechanism in place to fulfill the purposes of FIREA Section 308. By encouraging major corporations and huge banks to support the mission-driven bank fund, she's put in motion a mechanism that could provide tier one capital to our sector for generations to come. Once she departs from the chair, we must work to continue this effort. We should expand and support the launch and stabilization of the mission-driven bank fund and encourage it to invest first in the most vulnerable MDIs. We call for the federal regulators to take a critical look at how they examine MDIs and other mission-driven banks in terms of how they judge our peer groups and whether they are unfairly applying the same standards for financial performance to our banks, which serve underserved populations, as they apply to the banks that serve the wealthiest Americans. We need to support the work of Director Pearson and others to improve the diversity of the examiner corps, including at the leadership level. As an advocacy organization, the NBA calls upon the president and Congress to appoint regulators who will continue what's been started here and who will bring the right combination of excellent credentials and lived experience to these roles that impact all Americans. If we are intentional about advancing diversity and inclusion in the regulatory space, the FDIC and other regulators can give Americans more confidence in the financial system. In doing so, the regulators can play their role in eliminating the racial wealth gap to the benefit of all in our great nation. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend, the chairman of the FDIC, Yelena McWilliams. Thank you for your service, your empathy, and your commitment to our sector and to banking as a whole. No, no, no. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're and because James is about a foot taller behind me, I'm not actually not going to stand behind the podium. Otherwise, you won't even see me. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, James, for that. Uh, and uh, Chairman James, thank you for that. Uh, from one chairman to another, I, I could not have asked for a better intro. And your, your points um, on, on the racial wealth gap and how more needs to be done are, are as pro prominent and as, as imminent as, as they have ever been. So thank you for that and, and making sure that you keep track of what we're doing and keeping us accountable. Uh, I'm thrilled that so many have been able to join us today. By our latest count, close to 2,600 people registered to attend this event. And we're not even offering free snacks because we're remote. While I'm pleased that so many have joined us this morning, I'm not surprised. The issue of advancing diversity and inclusion across financial services cannot and must not be taken lightly. 
One of my earliest goals as chairman was to advance diversity and financial inclusion. And as James mentioned, this mission is not merely academic or theoretical for me. It's not even a statutory. It is personal. Some of you have heard me speak about my humble background, growing up on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, and even more humble beginning in the United States after I arrived by myself on my 18th birthday with $500. I will not repeat that story here, but suffice it to say that it would be easy to look at me today through the lens of the office I now hold, at least for another 15 days, and assume that I must belong in this society, that I know what belonging looks like. But I understand the perspective of those who cannot make ends meet despite holding multiple jobs, who cannot qualify for credit, who watch their checking account balance with daily trepidation, who ration heat in the winter to lower utility bills. When you have to do all that, and still barely survive, it is hard to feel that you belong. You feel disenfranchised instead. The prolonged pandemic has exacerbated the living circumstances of those who already felt like they did not belong or that the system was not working for them. Now, the FDIC has historically been a quiet banking regulator and not the venue most people think of for groundbreaking work on these topics. When I became FDIC chairman, I considered it my moral obligation to change the status quo on these critical issues, both internally and externally. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that I have placed heavy emphasis on financial inclusion and specifically on the question of how can we make all Americans, especially our most vulnerable communities, feel that our financial system is working for them. As I quickly learned on the job, the good old mold was no longer good. And changing the system would require serious thinking outside the box. Throughout my tenure, I have remained steadfast in my belief that the best way to create an inclusive banking system is to move relentlessly forward in fostering innovation. Innovation has not only made financial markets more efficient, it has democratized finance. Financial innovation has increased access to products and services, lowered their cost, and expanded the pool of creditworthy consumers. Since I was a young immigrant visiting a bank branch to open my first account, the paradigm has shifted entirely. Today, almost every adult is equipped with a smartphone and the ability to access thousands of financial services providers with a few taps. Not being limited by the time and cost of transportation to access financial services can be life-changing for the consumers who need it most. Our Office of Innovation, FDI Tech, recently brought together a diverse set of stakeholders in a tech sprint designed as a public challenge to banks, nonprofits, private companies, and others to help us identify the ways community banks can help the needs of unbanked and underbanked in an effective manner. The solutions presented by the selected team are going to be utilized to address these complex issues going forward. Thinking outside the box to support financial inclusion also requires us to assess where our rules may cause impediments in other ways. For example, Section 19 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act prohibits persons convicted of certain types of crimes from working at a bank. We took a fresh look at our policy implementing Section 19 and changed it to enable more individuals to work for banks. We now exclude all offenses that have been expunged or sealed, rather than only certain types of expungements from the scope of Section 19. We allow a person with two rather than one minor de minimis crimes on a criminal record to qualify for the exception. We no longer impose a five-year waiting period following a first de minimis conviction. Instead, we have established a three-year waiting period following a second de minimis conviction and no waiting period following a first de minimis conviction. We increased the threshold for small dollar simple thefts from $500 to $1,000. We expanded the exception for crimes involving the use of fake identification to circumvent age-based restrictions from only alcohol-related crimes and any such crimes related to purchases, activities, or premises entry. These changes have a major impact on individuals who no longer need to obtain written consent from the FDIC in order to work for a bank. Now, it did not take me long on the job to learn that the nation's minority depository institutions are the financial lifeblood of the communities they serve, enabling individuals and minority-owned small businesses to securely build savings and obtain credit. 
The FDIC has embraced our statutory responsibility to promote and preserve the health of MDIs by seeking new and innovative ways to engage with these institutions and better understand their needs. In addition to frequently engaging with MDIs throughout the nation with technical assistance, banker roundtables and networking events to connect MDIs and non-MDIs for potential business partnerships, we also increased MDI representations on our Community Bank Advisory Committee, established a new MDI advisory subcommittee to highlight the work of MDIs in their communities and to provide a platform for MDIs to exchange best practices. We enabled MDIs to review potential purchases of a failing MDI before non-MDI institutions are given this opportunity. We clarified that non-MDIs can receive Community Reinvestment Act credit for their collaboration with MDIs, and we established the Office of Minority and Community Development Banking to support the agency's ongoing strategic and direct engagement with MDIs, community development financial institutions, and other mission-driven banks. Now, when you have the weight of a venerable federal regulatory agency behind you, it is easy to assume that you know what is best for our regulated entities. It was critical for me not to assume that I intrinsically understood what MDIs need. As James mentioned, I wasn't born here. I don't know what it's like growing up in those communities. So back in 2018, I reached out to a number of MDI CEOs, many of them NBA and members, and I asked them, teach me. Teach me what do your communities need? Teach me about your business model. Tell me what a regulatory agency like the FDIC can do to help you help your communities. And each of those CEOs obliged. To them, I owe immense gratitude. Not only because they were patient with me poking and probing and asking difficult questions, but also because I was thirsty for knowledge and they allowed me to drink from the well. What I learned drinking from the well is that the MDIs, especially African American, Native American and Hispanic MDIs are in dire need of capital. When you get armed with that kind of knowledge, if you're a good person, you must execute on it. And so we did. I challenged the FDIC to come up with a framework that would allow these banks to access, uh, have access to capital. It took two years, but last September, we launched the Mission Driven Bank Fund, a collaborative investment framework to drive capital investment and other funding to FDIC-insured MDIs and CDFIs that support low- and moderate-income minority and rural communities, enabling them to build size, scale, and capacity to, in turn, allow them to provide affordable financial products and services to individuals and businesses, to stimulate economic and community development, and to build opportunity and prosperity in their communities. In designing the framework of the fund, the FDIC engaged approximately 70 chief executive officers of MDIs and CDFIs and their trade groups, as well as potential investors, investment consultants, and philanthropic organizations. We're pleased that Microsoft and Truist Financial Corporation are the anchor investors in the fund, and Discovery Inc. is a founding investor. Combined, these investors are pledging $120 million to support these mission-driven banks. So when we said all hands on deck, we meant all hands on deck. The FDIC also encouraged financial institutions to voluntarily conduct a diversity self-assessment and share results with our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. During, during my tenure, we released an automated form which was designed to make the process more user-friendly and more secure. But we did not stop there. In 2021, we partnered with the Ohio Bankers League and other federal agencies to educate a diverse pool of candidates who aspire to serve on bank boards. Within six months of the event, three attendees were added to Ohio bank boards and an additional eight are in the works. Notwithstanding this progress to close longstanding gaps, we know more needs to be done. We know more must be done. These collective actions have caused a structural and cultural shift in the way the FDIC approaches these issues. And I expect these efforts to continue long after my last day. Did I mention I have 15 days left? There is simply no going back to the old ways for the FDIC or for our country. Now, 
if English is not your first language, you know that proverbs are one of the most difficult aspects of English language to grasp for a non-native speaker. Now, over the years, I have skillfully crafted my own. I'll entertain you with a few because my staff gets a kick out of it. Not the sharpest tool in the drawer. The hair that broke the camel's back. Where the tire hits the road. Now, a couple of proverbs come to mind when I think of diversity and inclusion. Those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Sweep your own porch first. Now, I would have probably bought those too, but my friend Google made sure these are correct. Shortly after I became chairman, I realized that it was long overdue for the FDIC to take a hard and honest look at itself on the very issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I wanted to understand how FDIC employees feel. Do they feel as if they belonged in this agency? And the best way for me to find out was to hear it directly from the people. And hearing it directly from the people took some serious effort. So this is what I did. On numerous occasions, I took my lunch tray at the cafeteria, sat down with employees on their lunch break and asked about their experiences. Instead of driving to our Washington DC headquarters, I drove to our Arlington building, we're here in it today, boarded the FDIC shuttle to the DC building and talked to people, the employees on the shuttle bus about their experiences at the agency. When I received emails from employees expressing their concerns about long-standing issues, I immediately reached out either directly or through my chief of staff and asked, how can we help? How can we fix the system? Three things were important to me. I wanted our employees to understand that they were being heard, that their input was valued, and that the agency's top management cared. And I tasked senior management with making a concerted effort to think outside the box to address FDIC's long-standing DEIA issues. While more work remains to be done, I am pleased with the significant progress the FDIC has made with regard to DEI since 2018, as we established a team to improve the way we recruit, hire, and onboard examiners. We established an executive-level task force to promote a diverse and inclusive examination workforce. We sought to reduce possible barriers to racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of the FDIC workforce by hiring an independent consultant to conduct a barrier analysis. We reversed a decades-long trend by hiring minorities into the bank examiner workforce at a rate several points higher than the civilian labor force. We increased minority representation across the FDIC workforce, which at the end of 2021 included 32% minorities, 44% women, and 14% individuals with disabilities, and almost 13% of new FDIC hires in fiscal year 2021 were our nation's veterans. We increased diversity across leadership. Minorities now hold 25% of the management level positions at the FDIC, and women hold 41% of those positions. We reduced travel for on-site bank examinations and mandatory training often cited as a challenge to attracting and retaining a diverse workforce. We provided paid parental leave and supported student loan repayment programs. We increased our recruitment efforts by partnering with minority-serving institutions such as historically black colleges and universities. We partnered with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities to raise awareness about Hispanic-serving institutions in the FDIC's first-ever recognition of Hispanic Serving Institutions Week. We launched the agency's first ever program to support first generation professionals in the workplace, and we launched two, new, launched two new programs to develop the next generation of leaders with a corporate succession management focus to increase DEIA in the FDIC's leadership. And perhaps uh, equally important, we revised our pay setting principles for new hires to address inequities in the legacy system and conducted a pay adjustment program to ensure that current employees were paid consistent with these principles. All of that culminated in 2021 in our three-year diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. The strategic plan established diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility as an organizational priority and established for the first time in FDIC's history 
That is our corporate goal. The strategic plan provides actionable steps and a clear map forward for the agency. In addition to increasing the diversity of our workforce, we have also promoted the participation of minority and women-owned businesses, law firms, and investors. In 2021, the FDIC awarded $846 million in new contracts, with almost half being awarded to MWABs. The FDIC paid almost $4 million to minority-owned law firms and diverse attorneys, representing over 18% of contracted legal services. Although we have made progress, there are plans and strategy to do more. I am pleased to announce that this, hope, that this week the FDIC and John Hope Bryant's Operation Hope signed a collaboration arrangement to promote financial education using the FDIC's Money Smart curriculum, educate MWOPs on how to do business with the FDIC, and increase consumer access to affordable credit. Back in 2018, I vowed that until my last day on the job, I would fight to make the financial system work for all Americans. Now that I have 15 days left in my tenure, as I reflect upon the state of the FDIC workforce that I encountered in 2018 and compare it to today, I'm incredibly grateful for the monumental improvements we have made to sweep our porch. None of those, none of those accomplishments would have been possible without every single employee at the FDIC rowing in the same direction, that of willfully improving ourselves and making the FDIC an agency where all can belong. And I could not be more proud of our efforts over the past three and a half years to make our financial system better and more inclusive. I'm incredibly grateful to the National Bankers Association. Without MBA's guidance, support, education, and direction, we would have missed many of the important achievements along the way. To MBA and your members, Godspeed. I will cheer you, cheer you from the sidelines as you continue to accomplish the impossible. And I know the FDIC will be rowing alongside with you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Nicole Elam, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Bankers Association. And I am so honored to be with you today. We always have such great conversations. I love being here with you, and I'm beyond honored to be with you here today. This is this is uh, one of the best interlocutors I can have. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Well, I, I must say um, it's bittersweet. <clears throat> it's bittersweet to be here with you today, sharing the stage when we are two weeks out from your end of the chairmanship. And it's bittersweet because you have done so much for MDIs. You have been such a strong supporter. And I don't want to regurgitate everything that our chairman, Robert James, has said, but um, you've been a great supporter. I, I can't help but to recall one of our first uh, meetings, physical meetings together. It was at the Milken Institute conference, and we were on a panel together. And I was talking about a number of things that the federal government can do to preserve and promote MBIs. And I said, you know what, look, if regulators are serious about this, they need to create an office that is dedicated to it. They need to, to put resources behind it. And it was 10 days later, just 10 days later, that you called me up and you said, Nicole, I heard you, we're doing it, we're creating an office, it's going up today, it's not just name only, we're putting resources behind it. And then a couple of days after that, your chief of staff called and said, look, you know, there's one more thing that we really want to follow up with you on. And, and that's just one of many examples of the times that you have gone above and beyond to support, to partner with, and be responsive to our sector. And so for that, I am sincerely, sincerely grateful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And by the way, it was the next day, that day after the meeting, immediately after you said that, that I called up my chief of staff and said, we were setting it up, but we were federal government. So it took 10 days to actually be <laughs> able to, uh, to yeah. set it up. But no, it, it matters. And just like I wanted the FDIC workforce to be heard on these issues, I know that it's not just empty talk. Yeah. Words yeah. are empty, right? Yeah. Actions speak for themselves. I wanted you guys to know that we heard you. Yeah. And we took you seriously. Yeah. And yeah. we're not going to, uh, if we're not rowing in the same direction, we're not going to do this. We're, we're not, not going to accomplish it. anything. So thank you for your guidance along the you way. You know, one of the things that stuck out about that conversation was that you were upset that it took 10 days. You were like, Nicole, I'm so sorry. It took 10 days. I, I tried to do it in less than a week, but it took 10 days. And, and I'm telling you, again and again, that is how you have showed up for us. So thank you.
No, thank you. Now, I want to jump right into our conversation. There's, there's so many topics that I want to talk to you about, um, but I want to start with one of your recent achievements, and that is the launch of the Mission Driven Bank Fund. You talked a little bit about that in your remarks, but I, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your vision behind that fund, particularly as it relates to the preservation and promotion of MDIs and CDFIs. And, and then second, if you could talk a little bit about your successor, right? What advice would you give your successor in terms of how they should be viewing this fund uh, well i'll start with that make it bigger there oh. it bigger this is not enough you know yeah, this is just yeah. the beginning really what i was hoping to to accomplish before my chairmanship and had i had more time I, we, we were planning to go on this financial inclusion uh, uh tour mm -hmm. for better or for worse and where yeah. we would talk about the the mission driven bank fund mm -hmm. um and and make sure that corporate america make sure that folks understand that philanthropic philanthropic organizations understand do you understand the value of capital coming yeah. to the MDIs. Do you understand yeah. that for $1 that comes to this fund, that the fund then invests in a in a minority bank, there's going to be $10 mm -hmm. worth of lending, right? Yep. It's a one to X. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's one to 10 multiplier. It's extraordinary. So that leverage, you know, who I forgot who said, if you give me a poll long enough, I can I can move planet Earth. You know, it was one of those great philosophers. We'll have to ask Google after this. <laughs> yeah, Google is my best friend. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, and, and so use leverage, let's yeah. use leverage. And so I hope that whoever succeeds me understands the, the, the power yeah. of this fund, the power of $1 mm -hmm. in this community is because it's no longer $1, it's you know eliminating food, food deserts, yeah. it's promoting minority home ownership, it's mm -hmm. making sure that you know, your, your grandkid has a house yeah. uh, and, and that there is you know, generational wealth. Robert talked about the discrepancy mm -hmm. in generational wealth. You know, I came here with very little $500 and I had to build whatever I had to build. Mm -hmm. And it is with a view that my daughter won't struggle someday, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. what every parent wants mm -hmm. for, for their child. Mm -hmm. And if you generationally lose wealth, that's a problem yeah. because that's not how America is supposed to function. Mm -hmm. So anything that my successor can do to understand the power, the, the, the intent, uh, and, and of this fund and what, what capital can do in these communities and the leverage, mm -hmm. the power of leverage. So I hope they go on this huge advertising campaign about support the Mission Driven Bank Fund, support our communities. Oh. And I'll be cheering them from the sidelines. And I'll continue. I'll trust me. I, I may be, you know, I may be out of the FDIC in two weeks. I but think I, we I have won't you be... as an ambassador for life. Oh, I am. I am. I'm a lifelong ambassador. <laughs> I'm going I to be trying that. to make sure that people understand what this fund does and hopefully yeah. understand the value of contribu contributing to it. Well, I want to talk a little bit about financial inclusion and, and just, you know, so many people are talking about democratizing access and how technology plays a key role in that. But as you've aptly noted, financial inclusion and innovation, fostering innovation go hand in hand. But unfortunately, many of our MDIs haven't really been able to pursue innovative solutions. And it comes down to two big ways, two, two big reasons, rather. The first is capital, which the Mission Driven Bank Fund seeks to address. But the second is unfortunately regulatory constraints. You know, while regulators are talking about innovation, it's, it's oftentimes very difficult to actually implement that. So in, in your view, how should financial institutions and regulators alike really be thinking about navigating this space and what could at times be tension between financial inclusion and fostering innovation? Yes, and so this has been a huge uh, uh, focus point for me. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Um, I think that if we allow innovation to foster mm -hmm. and, and encourage it from a regulatory perspective, a small bank, a bank mm -hmm. that has $500 million yeah. in capital, right, in, mm -hmm. in, in assets, uh, that small bank can all of a sudden leverage technology to get new yeah. customers, to offer better products. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about when I became the FDIC chairman, I never had a community bank account. And now, you know, I was going to be uh, the, the chairman of an agency that regulates the largest number of community banks in the United States. So I was mm -hmm. like, I should open up a community bank account. Mm -hmm. So I had to drive out in Virginia and, and go to a bank. Uh, our examiners told me this one was good, so I go to a, to a good bank. Um, and I remember opening up the account and they, the lady literally typing up my account information on the old IBM typewriter and laminating mm -hmm. the card. And they mm -hmm. still, at the time when I opened up that account, yeah. did not have online banking presence. Yeah, yeah. 
And so I, if, to check my balance, I would have to pick up the phone. And and this was like phone. 1990s, right? And I think mm -hmm. since then they have actually invested into technology and all of that. So why, why did that happen? Did they not want to? Of course they wanted to. Right. But they're right. a tiny little bank. Yeah. They, they couldn't. They simply couldn't put the money aside. Technology the only a, is expensive. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be important uh, for regulators. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, as I'm leaving, you know, I hope FDI Tech, our innovation lab, persists because mm -hmm. we need to work together on a symbiotic partnership. Yeah. We need to be uh, looking at innovation mm -hmm. and regulatory burden and how to eliminate that regulatory burden so innovation can foster, right, mm -hmm. in a responsible way so that these little, these little banks, like the bank yeah. I, I signed up with as a customer back in 2018, can grow, can attract yeah. people, you know, can, can offer the yeah. same products that the super big banks can. Mm -hmm. And then think about the products and services, right? So if you're, you know, if you're a kid growing up in, in rural America and you don't really have a good access to education, uh, how are you going to build your credit? How do you know even that credit history matters, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if you're, if you're, you know, African American kid growing up in a, in a, in a inner city someplace and the educational system is not that good, how are you going to know that your credit yeah. score is going to be the difference between you be able, being able to finance that first mm -hmm. car or not? Yeah. And, you know, that first car gets you to a job and that job promotes Mm -hmm. financial you know inclusion and hopefully over time generational wealth building mm -hmm. so i think there is there is an opportunity for the united states here to lead for regulators to be more open to innovation it will be to you to yeah. continue pushing for that but i don't think this is a you know zero sum game i think yeah. this can be uh, uh, one of those things where compounded interest over time if we invest into innovation uh, appropriately can only lead to the betterment of people's lives and in many cases some of the people that have been neglected by our financial system over the centuries. And, and I love what you said. You said it's not that they don't want to, right? It, technology is so expensive. So if you are a small bank, which many of our MDIs have an average asset size of about 315 million, if you're a small bank taking on that technology expense, you don't have multiple branches to spread that cost across. So it, it is it is a huge thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, financial inclusion within the building, right? Because I think so often when the public and private sector talk about just D and I in general, they're talking about it externally. Mm -hmm. But you are really intentional about talking about what it looks like within the building, within the walls of the agency. Can you talk about some of the steps that you took when you first arrived at the FDIC to just get a lay of the land and, and to just understand what needed to happen to really make sure that you guys weren't just talking the talk, but you were walking the walk within the agency? Yeah. Oh, it's it's. Um... I was, to be honest with you, I was a little bit surprised um, how kind of a mechanical we were about yeah. it. Um, um, I, I, uh, I encountered a workforce that did not necessarily represent the banks we examined. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. I, if you go, yeah, so Nikita was here earlier, you know, she, she mentioned uh, being in, be starting out as an examiner in rural mm -hmm. Georgia. Yep. So when you send somebody to that little bank, to Nikita's community in rural Georgia, who doesn't look like the community, doesn't understand the mm -hmm. community, there's an... Um, that examiner can be a good person, can be a great person, but it's going to be very difficult to understand the business model of yeah. that community, right? Yep. And then by virtue of that, the business model of the bank. And so um, understanding how to create examining workforce that more appropriately reflects the banks that they supervise mm -hmm. was one of the key things that I realized would be important for us. Um, and I had this experience where we had a new graduating class of examiners and, and I came to congratulate them. Uh, and I sat at this lunch next to uh, a, a young man from uh, inner city Philadelphia, African-American gentleman. And I said, oh, so are you, how was your training? Did you like it? He said, yes, uh, I've learned a lot. And I said, so where are you going now? You know, did, did we assign you to a region yet or no? And he said, oh, I'm going to Texas. And I said, have you ever been to Texas? He said, no. I said, well, where in Texas are you going? And it was to Lubbock, Texas. No, Lubbock, Texas is not a large community, yeah, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking this, this, this gentleman grew up in a city. Mm -hmm. He's going to a by far more rural community where he has no connection. He's never been to Texas. Mm -hmm. There's no way he's going to feel imminent, imminently that he belongs. So I said, why, why don't we actually allow examiners to pick? Why don't we recruit them regionally for the places where they grew up, where they have families, where they have networks, where they understand the, 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 the you know, social structure? and their communities. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we change, and it's not, it's not brain science. I mean, I yeah. wish I, I could tell you this was like one of those, oh, it required, you know, yeah. a genius. It didn't. It required yeah. a few tweaks in the system yeah. to make sure that not only we expand our efforts to recruit minority examiners and train them, 
Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and really, in that in that respect, I, I'm so grateful to to our army director and my deputy Nikita Pearson because she literally relentlessly went to went to HBCUs and um, uh, and and other minority institutions, educational institutions, and actively recruited. And you know, it was one of those you have to be intentional yeah. about it. You can put it on the paper yeah. and file it and say we yeah. have a plan and yeah. we're done. So it was a number of those things, you know, uh, we would lose female examiners midpoint mm -hmm. in their careers. Mm -hmm. Why? Because on average, our examiners spend 88 days on the road. So if you're a mother of a young child, mm -hmm. do you think you want to be away from home three months out of the year? Yeah. You don't. Can you afford to? You can't. You yeah. can't. Because yeah. somebody has to take care of your baby. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so we said, why don't we implement technology mm -hmm. where our examiners actually don't have to tra travel so much? And it can mm -hmm. be, you know, they'll still have to do some traveling, but they'll have more control over yeah. that. Yeah. So none of these things are you know epic this is not you know we're building a, a new generation spaceship but it's that intentionality but yeah. it has to be intentional yeah. it has to be concerted everybody has to be you know i say rowing in the same direction mm -hmm. and then you have to make sure you actually execute on it you yes. know and yeah. and continue persistently with execution because nobody can drop the ball on this issue mm -hmm. must not drop the ball on this issue and i can't you know understate how important this issue of diversity and hue and view of examiners is you know this is a, a pain point for our mdis and so it's an area that we were very encouraged that you were talking about and being intentional about addressing you know many of our mdis have experienced unfortunately significant unfair barriers from and hurdles from bank examiners that just really didn't understand the institution, they didn't understand the mission of the organization, they didn't understand its community. And unfortunately, it led to many MDIs that closed their door because of this uh, examination process. And so it can't be understated how important it is to have uh, examiners that understand MDIs. Uh, so I would love to kind of take this question a step further and talk about what advice would you give your successor? on this particular topic of, of bank examiners and how important it is for them to, to know who they're examining. It is crucial. It is absolutely crucial. And, you know, we, we talk about in terms of understanding the community uh, uh, and, 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 you know, who the bank banks, yeah. you know. So for um, I've learned early on in my tenure, and again, I, I thank your bank CEOs for educating me. This was an educational you know, journey for they me. They don't mind talking, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it was it was wonderful. And in, in many in many um, instances, um, it was shocking, yeah. you know, when, when you, yeah. when you, at one point I was, I was shocked that we only have, you know, when I think when I joined about 20 uh, um, African-American MDIs in the United States. And then um, I was like, well, well, walk me through the history of all of that. I mean, I can read the books, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. we have, our library is very good. I can find stuff online. Google is my best friend, right? Uh, but as you tell me from your experience, like what happened to yeah. like banks in America? And, and, you know, they taught me, they, they taught me a lot of uh, things that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've learned is that the, the average size of a deposit account uh, in the black communities is much smaller than yeah. for many other MDIs mm -hmm. and and yeah. especially for the for the uh, uh, non-MDI banks, mm -hmm. right? So when your depositors come in to deposit twenty dollars, it still costs you the same amount of yeah. money to maintain that deposit account yep. as you would for a two thousand dollar deposit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the economies of scale are yeah. tremendously not working in your favor, right? Mm -hmm. So the average size of a black MDI, $318 million, right? Yep. In assets, like that is a very thin margin. I yep. mean, if you have, so if our regulations, for example, cause you to change your compliance systems mm -hmm. and each change in the compliance system that costs $250,000, mm -hmm. that's got to come from somewhere. Yep. And you have like six, seven people, mm -hmm. eight people on staff. Mm -hmm. So understanding the scale, understanding the impact of our actions, understanding that these regulations, no matter how well-intentioned, could have unintended consequences. Yeah. Understand in which way, how. Yeah. Make sure you talk to people and, and grasp that and frankly focus on what matters, which yeah. is that in order for these banks to survive, they need to be profitable, they need to be able to retain and attract and uh, have customers, and they need to be able to lend. So yeah. in order for them to be profitable, make sure that you know understand the business model and allow them mm -hmm. to function with their unique structure, right? Yep. In order for them to retain and attract customers, they need to have technology yes. and they can't and they can't develop it internally because it's costly. So allow them to partner up with others who have the technology and can provide it for cheap. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, long-term longe longevity of, of, of these institutions, mm -hmm. just focus exactly on who they are. So it, it's a more bespoke, yeah. more tailored way of yeah. managing our examination workforce to respond to the needs of the MDIs than we have done in the past. And I think that's going to be crucial going forward. I love that. 
We, we've talked a lot about a number of the changes that you've made in your, your tenure here at the FDIC. Um, of all the changes that you've made, which ones do you think are, are really have this foundational element that's going to continue to influence the way that the agency operates in the, in the future? So that's, that's always a tricky question. And I thought about it yesterday because an employee asked me that. And a colleague of mine asked me that question. And I said, you know, I haven't fully asked it. I need to have my elevator speech. I mean, this is like, I have 15 days. I better have an elevator speech. Better get it together. <laughs> and, and I don't have, it, it was 24 hours ago, so I don't have the elevator speech yet. But I will tell you this. I think one of the most uh, profound changes, uh, I think all of the things I mentioned, all of the things I mentioned, yes. internal, external, including yes. mission-driven bank fund, mm -hmm. are basically cultural changes. Yes. Yeah. Cultural yeah. changes. And you yeah. can talk about, you know, we didn't have this big screen here when I arrived, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you can throw money at that, yeah. right? But we didn't have the mission-driven bank fund. When I said, I want to have a shark tank for, you know, black banks and minority banks and cre let's mm -hmm. create a shark tank. Mm -hmm. I was said, it can't be done. We, yeah. we don't know how. And I yeah. said, well, we have 400 figure lawyers. <laughs> if those 400 lawyers can't figure out how to give me a shark tank for, for minority banks, then, you know what, I'll find another 400. And, yeah. and you know, it happened. Yeah. So it has to be... And that was, and then they were eager to actually make it, you know, and they knew it yeah. would be difficult. And then we got calls from the other regulatory agencies. Yeah. Why did you guys find the authority to do this? You know, yeah. well, we worked hard at it. Okay. <laughs> and so it has to, but all of that is cultural change. Yeah. You know, how we recruit examiners, how we look at our examining models, mm -hmm. cultural change. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I can, I can talk about the individual items, but they are all are just the, the bricks. They're the building yeah. blocks of a cultural change. And, and that's really what I'm most proud of. I hope it stays. I hope it's something that, you know, once people see yeah. at the agency, what, what that cultural change, the empowerment that comes with it and, and the exponential benefit to the society and our banking, uh, banking system, I hope they, they don't settle for less yeah. going forward. What, what policies do you want to see continue? I think culture is, is important and that can't be understated. Any, any policy that you really want to make sure stays? Or even I hope they all the stay. <laughs> I hope they all stay and then get you know yeah, even, even improved. Yes. Uh -huh. So I hope that uh, um, we have. Uh, it was important for me to empower people at the mm -hmm. FDIC, right? Mm -hmm. And what what I told them when I first came here, um, everybody would bring me almost every decision, you know, oh, at, at yeah. the senior management yeah. level. Bottleneck. And I literally would ask this. I would say, "How long have you been with the FDIC? Twenty five years, thirty years? Okay. Do you think I can do your job better than you?" Uh, that was a trick question. They usually were quiet <laughs> about that. And I said, I can't. I just arrived here. There's no way I'm going yeah. to have your knowledge. Yeah. Go make a decision. Yeah. Tell me why that's the best. You don't even need to tell me. Mm -hmm. Tell me. But if you have questions about your decision and you want to brainstorm that, come to me. Yeah. So empowering people to actually make decisions so that they're not afraid of their own shadow, right? Government is very hierarchical. You know, if it you're is. an associate manager, you don't want to go over the deputy manager mm -hmm. and the deputy mm -hmm. manager doesn't want to go over the mm -hmm. manager. So all of a sudden mm -hmm. I would get a sheet of paper that, you know, needs my signature and like 17 other people have I signed. signed yeah. And I'm just thinking, yeah. how long did it take 17 other people to <laughs> sign? Like this must have time. been like a three week process. A lot of time. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that empowerment of people yeah. stays because yeah. that's really what allows our regions and our regional directors mm -hmm. and examiners in charge to drive the process. Nobody knows your little bank better than the examiner in charge. We in Washington can't know it better. Yeah. So why would decisions yeah. on your little bank come up all the way to Washington mm -hmm. to be made? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't. So let's continue with that empowerment of the people and delegating the responsibilities from Washington more to the regions. I like that. So last question, we could, we could talk all day long, um, but last question, you're two weeks out. What final words would you have? Oh, oh, I don't have a elevator speech for that either. Um, be kind. Yeah. Be kind. And I think that goes at every level. Be kind to each other. For regulators, be kind. Yeah. You know, for banks to their communities, be kind. I like that. And um, I will say that uh, making a just system is difficult, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And it requires everyone coming from a place of purity uh, in their hearts and understanding that, Nicole, I didn't walk in your shoes, but I would love to know from yeah. your perspective what walking in your shoes looks like. Yeah. And having that conversation and having it with an open mind and exhibiting and exuding kindness to each other. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think we can have a kinder, gentler, better system if we just start with the very premise that we're all good people and that. we should hear each other's story. Be kind. Be, Be kind. kind. Well, you know, 
there will never be another Chairman McWilliams, but I certainly hope that you have set the stage for your successor and that your successor really looks to what you've done and all you've accomplished and particularly your support of, of MDIs and they continue to uphold that. Um, and so thank you again. It's been a pleasure working with you uh, in my short tenure at the National Bankers Association to your staff, Brandon, Nikita, everybody has been phenomenal partners to work with. So thank you. Well, thank you. And we couldn't thank you more. I will speak on behalf of the FDIC. I usually say, well, I don't always speak on behalf of the FDIC, but I will tell you this. Thank you personally. Thank you, Robert James. Uh, thank you, Kenneth Kelly, the yeah. prede Robert's predecessor, mm -hmm. Alden McDonald. I consider him the, the yeah. you know, the statesman of the whole organization who's taught me so much yeah. and so many more of your members who um, were kind to me. Mm -hmm. They were kind to me. I ask mm -hmm. all kinds of questions and they were probably, oh, Jesus, we got to educate her on everything. But they were kind to me. Yeah. They, they took their time. They explained to me things I didn't know. They explained to me things that were difficult. Uh, uh, politically sensitive. They explained to me things that mattered. And uh, my, my obligation, once again, that knowledge was to try to make the system better and execute on it. And uh, it's been a great honor and a great pleasure to do that alongside with MBA. Um, and I hope, uh, I know I will see you on the other side, yes. but I hope you continue that engagement with the FDIC. And, and I know that the workforce that I have encountered here wants to do that with you. So I look forward to see the wonderful things you all are going to do together and I'll be cheering you from the sidelines. Oh, we know you will be. Thank you. Well, it is certainly bittersweet to um, end this conversation, but on behalf of the FDIC and the National Bankers Association, we wanna thank you all for tuning in to this important conversation today. Thank you.